here on the famed Sunset Boulevard in the heart of Hollywood, California, that I sit down for an exclusive interview with the chairman and CEO of the Motion Picture Association of America, Senator Chris Dodd. I'm Michael Real, and this is RealUrbanNews.com. Senator Dodd, tell us about the Creativity Conference. Well, the idea was to, to sort of uh, uh, educate people about the importance of innovation and creativity. Uh, about two million people in this country got up this morning and went to work in the film and television business, or a job dependent upon that. Ninety-five percent of them are never going to walk a red carpet or have their picture on the cover of People magazine. These are hard-working people out there that drive trucks, electricians, carpenters, makeup people, sound people. Uh, film people, the only people we got right in the room here with you, Michael, mm -hmm. are, are the people we talk about. Sure. And so creativity is important for you to understand how we've benefited as a country. Both We've been, been entertained, we've been motivated, we've been educated, we've been stimulated mm -hmm. uh, through the use of film uh, for almost 100 years now. We've led the world in many ways Why other countries make film and do a great job. Most would admit today that consistently the best products are made in the United States. And we're getting better at it with new platforms, new opportunities for people that didn't exist even a few years ago. So I'm excited about being a part of this industry. And I know techno technology had to be at the center of this conference. It did, exactly right. In fact, we hosted the event with Microsoft mm -hmm. and ABC News. So it wasn't so the so-called traditional. I always say to people, look, I represent technology companies who manufacture content. Okay. <laughs> other technology companies manufacture other things. But I manufacture content. That's my job, my, what my studios do and the independent filmmakers do. And so we partnered up with Microsoft and ABC News to talk about the importance of technology and content. It's not a choice where you pick one side of the equation or another and somehow we're all winners. Right. Technology needs content, content needs technology. Sure. And, and my little girls growing up are going to have so many more opportunities right. to see things and to enjoy things as well as learn things that you and I never had that right. opportunity before. Sure. So it's an exciting time. Yeah. I know we were looking at some of the photos and your uh, colleague, Vice President Biden, I yeah. know he was a, a key cog in this magnificent wheel. Talk about uh, what, Bri what Vice President Biden brought to the conference. Well, he and Judy Hsu from California, Congresswoman, uh, so many other people who are uh, co-chairs uh, when he was in the Senate sure. of a creativity uh, caucus, uh, a copyright intellectual property caucus. And it was people who understood the value and the importance of this, not just in terms of film and television, sure. but the innovations and creativities in the, in the country. So he comes to the Vice Presidency with a long history of having been involved in the issues. He was chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee during some of the most controversial nomination hearings for Supreme Court justices. But all during that time, he maintained a strong interest mm -hmm. in innovation and creativity. So he was a, a perfect choice uh, to be a keynote speaker at the Creativity Conference in Washington. Great. This past Oscar season, we saw the movie 12 Years a Slave right, right. win the Best Picture yep. uh, Movie of the Year Award. Right. And we've also seen recent developments uh, prior to that with Cheryl Boone Isaac becoming yep, the president exciting. of the uh, Academy. Right. How exciting is that uh, from I, your perspective? I think tremendously important. I mean, this is uh, it's taken a long time, too long, candidly. And I'm proud of the fact that in my 36 months here, we started a diversity and multicultural uh, outreach program at the Motion Picture Association uh, among doing a number of things uh, to try and introduce more audiences uh, to talented uh, minority filmmakers, emerging filmmakers. And obviously that uh, when you had uh, Fox Searchlight uh, produce 12 Years a Slave, uh, you see the new leader of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Ms. Isaacs. Uh, not to mention a variety. There were some 10 films this year that came right. out from the minority community. Mm -hmm. Not everyone achieved the status of 12 Years a Slave or The Butler uh, or mm -hmm. Fruitville Station and so right. forth, uh, which we hosted, by the way, at the Motion Picture Association. Mm -hmm as well as having Ryan Coogler come and talk to an audience there about why films matter mm -hmm. and why it's important to reach out and encourage uh, minority filmmakers. Just did an event the other night with the Asian Pacific American Caucus as well to recognize uh, a documentary film sure. celebrating the life of an, uh, the first member of Congress in the 1940s from, from Asia. So we're trying to do a lot of things. We do a, a screening now, free screenings at the Stone of Hope mm -hmm. uh, on the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington with Cry Freedom, among other films that we sure. Screened outdoors last summer. We'll do it again this summer. Okay. Uh, I've been a major supporter and backer of the uh, American Black Film Festival, uh, and we'll do it again in New York. Now moving to Miami, right. uh, Trailer Fest, which we are going to host again. So uh, I'm trying to do a lot more, and a lot more needs to be done. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not crowing about this, but I'm right. trying to. We were starting from almost zero. Sure. <laughs> three, right. Three years ago. So 
we've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go yet. This industry, I've been reading the history of it out here uh -huh. and how these, 100 years ago, most of these companies are just about 100 years old, 1912, 1913, 1914, and a lot of them were immigrants mm -hmm. uh, that started the business, and so they were minorities sure. in their own way. Sure. Uh, a lot of them were, were the Jewish faith, mm -hmm. the majority were in many ways that started the company, whether you're talking about Adolf Zucker or you're talking about the Lowe's family or you're talking mm -hmm. about the, uh, Jack Warner and his brothers right. uh, that came in. Uh, William Fox uh, and others that started these companies and in many ways uh, created American dreams in the sense because they were fulfilling their own dreams as immigrants coming here. And, and I think keeping that, that theme alive, that, that this industry has done so well when it has been courageous and forward-leaning and embracing uh, immigrants, minorities and others, telling their stories, sure. uh, creating that more perfect union that the founders of this republic talked about. It's never going to be perfect, but if we can get closer, maybe it be more a more perfect union, then each generation bears that responsibility. And the ability of this community to educate people not only here but around the world has been phenomenal. How do we, with all this new young talent yep. and all these uh, different platforms, the uh, obviously you think about online, yep. the major platform, right. a major shift, how do we harness America's young talent? Well, today they have more opportunities. That young Jeffrey Katzenberg, that young Spielberg, that young Spike Lee that just showed up today, right. arrived here in town on a bus uh -huh. with a dream of becoming a filmmaker. Sure. They have so many more opportunities than those three names that I mentioned a generation ago mm -hmm. because there aren't any more platforms today. The equipment, we're watching equipment here being used that was unavailable even a few years ago, right now, at this very moment. Right, yes, sir. Uh, and, and it's not as expensive as the old equipment used to be. Uh, we sponsor a short film festival as well, uh, and uh, with people who now, just those five-minute films that people enter. Some enter with just an, a, a, an iPhone. Right. <laughs> That's their camera. <laughs> and so today, if you have a dream about making a difference in film and television, today you can get into this so much more easily than a Spike Lee did, a Steven Spielberg did, a Jeffrey Katzenberg did, a Jim Giannopoulos. I mean, you go down that list right. of, of the great filmmakers in, uh, in this town. Uh, today. They'll be the first to tell you, you'll have so much more opportunity to make a difference, not only here, but globally. If you've got the talent, the ability, and you're a great storyteller and how to put that story on, uh, on, on digital, right. not on film, <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, then you've got, you've got a great chance, yeah. unlike any other generation had before you. In three years, are you happy with what you all have achieved? I am. I think we're in a different place. Uh, the industry is doing better. That's not my responsibility obviously they have business models although they're doing a better job in reaching out to to broader communities we had a 16 percent increase in the Hispanic moviegoers in the United States now 70 percent of revenues are coming offshore huge market growth in the Pacific Asian Pacific area as well um, I'm going to be working with um, a fellow by the name of Mo Ibrahim who's a Sudanese man uh, was an innovator in the cell phone technology has a foundation uh, we're going to be working with them to have filmmakers from Africa as well as the United States doing workshops and panels at their next large gathering uh, in, uh, in New York uh, or in Africa to try and encourage more emerging filmmakers in that huge continent. Nigeria does a lot, maybe makes more movies than any country in the world. Right. Uh, Nollywood, they call it. Right. <laughs> uh, but their audience is a domestic one in Nigeria, some in Kenya, some in South Africa, but there's a lot bigger audience out there as well in this new platform, merging platforms right. uh, that are occurring. So I'm excited about where all of this is going. Cool. Okay, I, I know you're having a great time traveling around the country and around the yep. globe, talking about this American film industry yep. and uh, all the stories that are able to be told from pictures. Yeah. What is your job as president? Well, the CEO is one, a couple of things. One, the content. There's still a problem with, with, with theft of the content. And there are a lot of hard-working people. You, if you stay around longer at the end of a film and watch the credits, <laughs> right. sometimes they're longer than the movie. <laughs> and, and so protecting the people who work in this business, their jobs, hard-working people, most of them are not, as I say, movie stars walking red carpets. Right. They're trying to raise families, pay mortgages, and, and encounter all the problems that families do in life. They deserve to have their jobs protected. And when you create something, uh, you ought to be able to protect that creation, that innovation. So that's number one job. And there's a major problem with theft of content right. today. That's number one. Two is to grow the market as well. And we're doing that globally. As I mentioned, 70% of the revenues now come offshore. It used to be under 50% only a few years ago. 
And so it's growing. All over the world, this product is growing and opportunities to see it. Third, I work with the profitability of it. The company's trying to keep jobs here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now 40 states have production credits where they try to attract the filmmaking to, uh, to our cities. I just was in Cleveland where about 40% of uh, Captain America right. was shot in the streets of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in Atlanta in a week or so where a Disney film was shot down there as well to say thank you mm -hmm. to the hotel workers, to the laundry guys, to the diners, mm -hmm. as well as the extras in these films in a local area for helping make that product become, uh, become real. And that's important because I guess as moviegoers, we're sitting in the theaters in these comfortable chairs right. and we're not thinking about all the jobs that are connected to this industry. Huge. But that's your responsibility. That is, to go out to remind people of that. I mean, it's not just about the high paid actor, and I sure. respect them as well, or the director or the producer. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of people who work in this business, $43 billion in wages <laughs> in the United States, $41 billion in, in, in payments made to vendors, <laughs> the 310,000 vendors in the United States whose livelihood depends upon a domestic film industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and now with 40 some odd states that are actually in the business of production. New York it does a great deal, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Ohio, uh, New Mexico, Georgia. Uh, Tyler Perry has this huge facility in Atlanta. Uh, has done a remarkable job in producing quality television programming and film. 25,000 people in Georgia today work directly in the film and television business. Wow. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it earlier, uh, looking at the landscape of the importance of the independent filmmaker. Yeah, as well. When we think about the multicultural uh, communities around the globe, mm -hmm. how important is that independent filmmaker to the movie business? It's huge. I mean, again, I, I represent the, the, the large studios. Uh, right. But they will tell you as well, they work with independents as well. I mean, today there's usually, if you watch who's made a film, in the old days it was just one company. It was sure. Paramount or Warner Brothers. Today you'll see those names, but you'll also see other names uh, as part of the introduction of a film. So the independent filmmakers are critically important. If you go to these film festivals, like in Santa Monica, there's a great market there, the Cannes Film Festival. There are a thousand kiosks there with local filmmakers, independent filmmakers, selling their products all over the world. Uh, it's a very vibrant entrepreneurial business. Uh, they're all not uh, highly successful, but they're trying. And uh, so it's more than just the big companies which are critically important and do a great job, but also these independent filmmakers as well that are creating opportunities for people that didn't exist in the past. I know you touched on it a, a bit earlier, it's the, the challenge of theft. Mm -hmm. How damning is that to this industry? It's a lot, it really is. And again, we have, a, do, we have to do a better education job to remind a generation coming along that to respect people's innovations and creativity. And, and, uh, and you'll see as, as something like uh, uh, Game of Thrones, which is right. a very popular, uh, TV drama that HBO does, there are about 400,000 thefts of that program. Okay. Uh, Breaking Bad was a very popular uh, uh, program on HBO right. as well. Uh, it wasn't HBO, excuse me, CBS. And they had huge amount of thefts. I think it was like 800,000 thefts of that, the last episode of that program. So it does undermine the ability to do a couple of things. One is to raise money. A lot of venture capital is necessary to finance film or television. Not all of it is financed by the studios or the independent filmmaker. It's hard enough to get an investor to write a check to support the creation of a product. Mm -hmm. uh, only four out of 10 films ever make a nickel back. Wow. Six out of 10 lose money. So if I'm trying to get you to invest in my product, you're worried first of all whether or not it will make under the best of circumstances anything. When I add the fact this film may be stolen or this TV right. show is stolen thousands and thousands of times, that doesn't encourage you to write that check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so it undermines our ability to continue to produce, provide those jobs for people as well. So content theft isn't just about stealing, it's about stealing people's livelihoods, not just the product. Finally, as we prepare to close, what's your hope for the film industry as we continue to advance in the 21st century? Well, one, that it be more inclusive, that it reach out as well and uh, develop. I admire what uh, 20th Century Fox did with 12 Years a Slave, taking a chance on a product, uh, taking a chance on emerging filmmakers as well. We need to encourage more of that, in my view. Again, it's been a great source of employment, economic growth. Seven to one, seven dollars to one dollars, exports to imports right. in this right. country. Not many industries in the United States even claim that record as well. So it's a great business, great job creator, and great educator. How many people's lives were changed in the 1940s because they saw a gentleman's agreement about anti-Semitism? How many people's lives were changed because of Kill a Mockingbird? I mean, you can talk about the documentaries and the editorials and newspapers, but I suspect an awful lot of Americans got better educated by that film than almost anything else. 
Philadelphia uh, with Tom Hanks yes, great movie. about HIV and AIDS. Sure, sure. A lot of people had a different view of that issue and that disease and that problem as a result of that film. And you and I go down and name film after film after film that just didn't educate you and me. It taught us something. Mm -hmm. It changed our minds about how we looked at our neighbors, how we looked at the world in which we live. And to me, that's the great value of this in many ways. It's entertainment's great, uh, but it's that education, that stimulation, that causing you and I to maybe think a little differently about the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, to me, it's, uh, I'm only going to do this so long. I'm only one, one person along a chain of all of sure. this. I spent 30 years in the United States Senate. Sure. If you had told me five years ago, you and I would be having this conversation, I'd be wondering what you were smoking. Well, I was smoking. <laughs> and, and so and not me. It's not, not me. But it's, so I'm, I'm in a different place sure. today. But I've become an advocate, a huge advocate of this industry and business, mm -hmm. and proud to be a part of it. But we also know that, we also know that you were groomed. Your family has a long history of helping America. Well, my father was a senator and cared an awful lot about things. He, I wasn't alive at the time, but in the late 1930s, he and my mother had to be escorted out of the state of Arkansas because he won a jury trial on a lynching case. He was one of the Justice Department in those days. Uh, he was one of the floor managers of the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s, 1964. Um, and so I grew up in a household where equality and opportunity was very much something that was part of our, our childhood mm -hmm. growing up. Right, I never right. imagined I'd be spent 36 years in the United States Congress, six mm -hmm. in the House and 30 in the Senate, but proud to have tried to carry on that legacy that my father, I think more courageously in his time because it was more of an uphill climb in sure. those days. Uh, but uh, we're still climbing mountains and still uh, have a ways to go, but we're getting there. What has it been like to work with uh, President Barack Obama? It's great. He and I we have sat together on the Foreign Relations Committee for the years he was in the Senate, got to know each other well. Um, I've, I've, I've seen him a lot during his tenure. Obviously, he's in a different place today. We had a nice uh, lunch together in December, just before the Christmas holidays, mm -hmm. uh, alone, which was very pleasant of him to invite me down for that. Sure. And uh, he loves movies, by the way. Right. I'm told he watches more movies and he cares more about them than any president in history. Going back to Woodrow Wilson, who was the first American president to watch movies uh, in the White House. And he's a good man. Uh, he's doing the best he can for the country. I admire him immensely, and mm -hmm. I think he's leaving a great legacy. I'm, Health care. I'm so honored to have been a part of writing half the health care law, uh, right. the Dodd Frank legislation, sure. financial reform, sure. and then things like uh, dealing with mental health parity and a variety of other issues during the last uh, last two years. I was in the Senate in his first two years as president, and we've maintained that friendship since I left. Senator Dodd, thank you for a wonderful Michael, opportunity. Thank you very much. Enjoyed talking with All you. Right, thank you. you bet. <laughs>